Well, colleagues and friends, um, glad to see you with us. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, mm -hmm. I think we start by thanking the speakers, uh, particularly those from Juba and from Khartoum, um, <clears throat> and those who recommended speaker to us. We are very grateful. This is our second uh, webinar uh, event. Uh, the first one was very successful. We have registered about over 100 people for this um, webinar. So we expect, because of the importance of the topic on economic and financial institution of both Sudan and South Sudan, we are expecting many questions. And <laughs> there is no direct question between Richard, who will be chairing the session, but people can write their questions and Richard will look into this and see how he could uh, <clears throat> join some of the question together for a particular speaker. Now, I, I'm very strict on time. Each speaker will have 20 minutes. And then at the end of all the uh, presentation, there'll be question and answer. I would like also to thank Richard for joining the question and answer later on. And also Caroline, the administrator, who has been really a tower of support for, um, for so many months, particularly um, dealing with the webinar. I, I'm not used to it, Richard does, and I think some of you, this is a new thing to me, <laughs> you know, the Zoom webinar, but she is really wonderful help to us. I just want to let you know that there will be two more functions taking place uh, with the Sudanese program. The first will be if you register 22nd of May, this coming May, and the title will be Youth, Inclusivity and Participation in Politics, the Economy and Society. What we need is the younger generation at, you know, perception of what happened so far in Sudan and South Sudan and how they project the future from their perspective. And I think that's very important. Uh, for our discussion. This has been on the card for some time to engage the youth in the discussion about the future of Sudan and South Sudan. The second event, a long uh, delayed conference at Manchester mm -hmm. University, I have been, in, or University of Manchester has been in touch with me because of government regulations. It's difficult to have the conference in January, in July, 24th of July. They have advised that we should um, postpone it to September or even later, and then the lockdown will be over. So I have consulted the Southern Sudanese colleagues in North of England, and they're very much in support of delaying it till September or October. So I'm, I'm Zooming with Manchester University sometime next week to do, decide a date, and that date will be communicated to you in due course. For the younger generation, I have about four or five, very kindly, and I have a list of about other 20 recommendations being made. So it's, it looks extremely interesting, the specialization. And you will hear in due course um, some of the participants as well as their contribution. I thank Iman Sharif, who is, has joined us for recommending one speaker. Uh, so, and Johara, if you could recommend somebody. And Iman knows we need younger people between 20 and 30. I am not against anybody above 30 or 40, but the whole idea is the youth. Okay? So, we thank you very much indeed. And I think without further ado, that we should really start this uh, webinar. Unfortunately, Augustino, not yet on. And uh, apologies from Professor Hassan Bashir, um, who is uh, Vice Chancellor of Red Sea University. He couldn't join us because of technical problems that he cannot um, connect with us. But what I will start is perhaps Raja. Uh, Raja is an economist. She is a lecturer at Juba University in Economic Faculty of Social and Economic Studies, Republic of Sudan. Um, she's very experienced. She's done a lot of research on this, and we are very glad to have her. Raja, you have 20 minutes. 
um, to make your presentation. So shall I give you the floor for that, please? Raja, so you start, yes. thank you. Uh, thank you very much, my uh, fellow speakers and the audience. As introduced earlier on, my name is Raja and uh, I'll be presenting the, the status of the financial uh, institution in South Sudan, financial institution of formats in South Sudan. So I'll first start with the overview of the presentation of which I will um, uh, go straight to the introduction. The type of financial institution in South Sudan are the Bank of South Sudan objectives, the current performance of the financial institution, the, challenging, the challenges that are facing the financial institution and the policy recommendations. A financial institution um, these are companies engaged in businesses uh, that are dealing with the, that are dealing with the uh, transactions such as deposits, loans, um, investment, and current uh, and currency deposits. So in South Sudan, uh, financial institutions contribute uh, to the development, to the economic growth of a given country like my country. And uh, financial system provides key to so balancing the flow of uh, money in the economy. So uh, South Sudan has different types of financial institution. And according to the Bank of South Sudan 2020 um, report, the financial institution consists of uh, 30, uh, commercial banks operating in the country, of which six are foreign banks. We have 12 national banks. We have 12 joint ventures in the in the banking uh, uh, in the banking industry, and ma majorly they focus in cash deposit. Of course, I asserted earlier on uh, cash withdrawal, transfer, and uh, and petty um, foreign foreign currency exchange. So we also have uh, 53 forex bureaus. We have 10 microfinance institutions and we have 28 insurance companies. So let's move to the, uh, the objective of the bank, uh, the bank of South Sudan. It's basically to maintain the monitor and the domestic uh, price stability and to foster uh, liquidity and effective functioning of the stable market based on the on the, on the financial system. And of course, this will promote uh, a safer, sound and efficient national payment system which aims to maintain the uh, stability of the financial system as a whole. Uh, the bank also supports the general economic policies of the government and, the, and promotes sustainable uh, economic growth. So uh, what are the legal frameworks that govern the financial institutions in South Sudan? Uh, we have the, the, the South Sudan Banking Act 2011, we have the Anti-Monetary Laundering, and we have the Financial Act. These are the, the, the legal frameworks that govern the uh, the, the operation of the financial institutions in, in, in the country. So what are the, the monetary policies of the Bank of South Sudan that we consider the central bank? Uh, one of the policy is the, the, the capital for the commercial banks and uh, that is uh, 50 million SSV for the national banks and 30 million for the international uh, or for the foreign banks. However, uh, of recent last 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 year, uh, the Bank of, uh, of of South Sudan decided to discontinue, like, so that they encourage more uh, commercial banks to join the economy, and they even reduced the reserve requirement ratio from twenty to ten. You know, so that uh, commercial banks deposit more. Uh, Cash to the central bank. Currently, as I talk, we have the the, the forex the forex uh, exchange auction that is taking place, and this is mainly given to the to the forex bureaus. They 
The intention is to withdraw the, the excess cash that is, that is in the economy, you know, so that uh, the, the Bank of South Sudan hold the currency in the economy. Let's go to, to the current performance of the financial institutions. Although we have a number of um, commercial banks, as I stated earlier on, however, they only deal with basics, you know, basics banking, uh, banking activities like deposits, like withdrawal, and like maybe uh, a cash transfer, but they don't actually uh, offer loans to the business community. Uh, I spoke to some few uh, colleagues who work with uh, equity bank and cooperative bank, and they told me that they only have, they only give uh, salary loans, you know, to the NGO, uh, to the NGO employees, but then like loans for businesses, they are not being given by the commercial banks. And we have limited ATM located at the urban areas, you know. So as you move outside of Juba, it's rare to find uh, uh, like banking services, you know, in the rural areas of South Sudan. Of, South Sudan. of course, another, uh, another point is that we, the, the financial institution lack insurance, you know, insurance on the deposits. Like as now I can mention that Chatter One Bank and, and is out of the, the banking operation and the clients are unable to get their deposits, you know, to get their money from the bank. So there is distress, you know, debt distress at, at, at the bank and the banks, most of the banks are out of operations in the financial market. And we have less liquidity at the commercial banks, you know, as, as, as I mentioned earlier on, um, some of the, uh, the amount of the commercial banks were used, you know, by the, by the Bank of South Sudan. So therefore it becomes very, very difficult for the, um, for the commercial banks to, to, to you know, to, to pay their customers their deposit because, you know, it's current accounts basically. So current accounts are on demand. So there is also another good practice that is happening, and this is like uh, we all of us know that this organization. So most of these organizations are vulnerable people in the society or in my country. So therefore, um, uh, the organization use commercial banks like Alpha uh, commercial banks to you know disperse disperse this. Um, amount to the vulnerable people and this is actually one of the important roles that is ha happening in the in the country so what are the challenges that are that are facing the the financial institutions in the country of course uh, one of the challenges the insecurity that started in 2012 and then it also repeated itself in uh, in 2016 and and some of these commercial banks like KCB, like Equity in Bor and in, in Malacca, some of the, the state capitals, they were you know, looted and destroyed. So the bank lost a lot of, a lot of money and this provide this incentive to the banking sector. We have, uh, there is lack of infrastructure that is facing the, the commercial banks like roads, like the internet, like the electricity. So therefore, the, the banking services are very, very limited to areas, you know, they, they use generators, you know, to, to operate most of, the, uh, most of the activities. I came up, of course, you also have the challenge of the data, you know, as, as you can see in my presentation, I'm supposed to maybe present some graphs and see maybe the non-performing loans, how much is this, but I couldn't because there's lack of data. So that is also another challenge. We are facing. So I, I, I have uh, the recommendations that uh, uh, I would recommend that uh, this the extension because what is happening now is that the the forex the the, the foreign currency auctions that is taking place is only zeros. So at least they should extend these services to the to the commercial banks so that they are able to extend to the business community. You know to import because the country heavily rely on imports, you know, we don't produce, you know, and that's why um, the exchange rate is increasing. You know, even if we have this intervention as a policy, 
safety intervention, but still the exchange rate remains $1 to 600 SSP. And this 600 SSP used to bring $200, but now it's only $1, you see? So it's, it's really um, an issue in the sector. Uh, I would also recommend the commercial banks maybe to provide loans, products for the business community. There's need <coughs> to build international reserves. You know, we are a rich country. We have gold, we have uh, uh, the gum Arabics, we have some of the agricultural products. We could actually export them so that we build our reserves in the country. The banks should also uh, uh, come up at least to perform its role of being the lender of last resort because this is the mandate of the central bank or the Bank of South Sudan. You know, the, at least they should be able to rescue some of the commercial banks that are collapsing, you know, that have really gone, at least they have to give them, provide them with capital so that they, 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 they come back to, you know, to operation and provide the banking services and to the population as a whole. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's really need for monthly monetary data, you know, so that the policies that we generate are based on the, on the data, you know, data evident policies. Independence of the central bank is very, very important, the Bank of South Sudan, so that it, there's no interference maybe from the military or from the political uh, 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 appointees. At least the independence is very, very important so that the central bank is able to, uh, to perform its role, you know, as the monetary, monetary uh, monopoly institution in the country. And of course, um, I would recommend the commercial banks to focus on the capacity development of the financial institution, you know, in line with the modern banking technology. There's also need because most of these banks have run out of liquidity. And now most of the, 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 the clients, you know, they have lost trust. So therefore there's really need for the banking industry to rebuild the trust with the people or with the customers, you know. So, and above all, you know, without political instability, without peace, without, you know, implementation of the agreement that we have, the sector will remain, you know, will struggle until. So there's really need that uh, the, the authorities should really ensure that they implement the peace so that we have the investors coming to the country, both the local and the international investors and the financial sector, you know, do well. So in conclusion, the financial uh, institutions in South Sudan are really struggling, to be honest. And that requires intervention uh, from the central bank and other stakeholders. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Oh, well, thank you very much indeed, Raja. I think you put your finger on two issues, stability, and I think that's very, and peace. That is really very essential for economic development in the South. <clears throat> I just want to ask you one question. Um, is there any supervision or control by the central government on commercial banks, apart from the central bank? Uh, I think at yeah, the central bank, we have the, the supervision uh, department. Yeah. But is there any supervision by the government on these commercial banks? Yeah, the central bank has the directorate of the supervision, bank supervision. And this directorate is responsible to supervise all the commercial banks right. in the country. Thank yeah. you very much. We yes. yeah. Good. Well, thank you very much, Raja. I'm sure there will be some question asked from the participant. Um, now I turn to Iman. Iman Sharif, she is an academic and she is at, at uh, Bangar Business School, United Kingdom. She is a monetary economist, and she's going to talk on the impact of loan rescheduling on economic growth in the Republic of Sudan. As you know, Sudan is indebted something in the region, 63, 64 billion dollars, been accumulated since Nimeri's regime until the present time. So I leave it to Iman to talk about the future of Sudan with regard to you know, loan rescheduling. Iman? Thank you. Okay, I was trying to share my presentation. Uh, really happy to be with you, and many thanks, Dr. Dr. Ahmed, for this opportunity. Uh, 
And uh, hello to everyone, uh, Mr. Anis Hajar, Dr. Richard, and all my friends and colleagues from Sudan. Uh, my name is Iman. Uh, I'm Iman Sharif. Um, I live in North Wales since a while, uh, 20 years now, and um, I'm an economist at the Bangor Business School in North Wales. Uh, since a while, I've been working on uh, the impact of uh, loan rescheduling on economic growth in Sudan and South Sudan. And why is it important? I start the presentation. This paper is a review. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, um, I'm analyzing um, other empirical work that has been done on the area. I found uh, so many references from Sudan and from outside Sudan as well. And um, I started the presentation. I found this uh, during my readings, Dr. John Yo. Um, I think uh, it was during the session and the uh, discussions. He said uh, maybe <laughs> he became so tired of the figures. And he said the best thing to do is for both parties uh, to convince the donors to cancel these debts. So <laughs> we will see what happens. Um, why is it external debt? Because external debt is, um, is a financing instrument for uh, less developing countries like Sudan and South Sudan and many among many others in, 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 in Africa and in Asia and Latin America as well. And uh, unfortunately, uh, governments borrow, um, they're supposed to borrow in order to finance their development. But instead, most of the time, the borrowing is done to fund um, uh, to fund the, 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 their, their expenditure and to cover, uh, to, to balance their books. Uh, and this is how when um, um, external borrowing becomes a burden for the, for the, for the government and for the nations, because it's the, the, the citizen who pays the price. Sudan has a story with um, outstanding debt, as it has been outstanding since the 1970s. And um, uh, the World Bank and the IMF, they have classified Sudan as a non-sustainable country of non-sustainable debt. And um, the thing is, uh, since the 1970s, uh, the regime at the time, I believe, um, has embarked in, um, um, in a process of industrialization um, as they say. And, and the money was coming into the country, uh, but um, unregulated. There wasn't a single unit in the government that was responsible for the foreign, to deal with the foreign debt, organize it and regulate it. That's why uh, we ended up with uh, several uh, government agencies and um, units uh, borrowing from outside uh, without any uh, organization or and um, uh, the, the problem um, with the debt, Sudanese debt, that even the Sudanese government didn't know uh, the amount of debt that it owed to the world. And um, it was um, only in the 1980s, they had to employ a legal accountant, accounting firm based in London uh, to do the job for them, to look up how much they owed to whom and when was the money taken out. This was during the 1980s. And um, during the late 1970s, in order to regulate um, um, its relationships with the, uh, uh, the big um, uh, agencies, the, the lending agencies like the IMF and the World Bank, uh, Sudan had to adopt um, the um, SAP Structural Adjustment Program in order to help the country rehabilitate the economy. Uh, and the debt, and uh, in order to be able to receive more uh, foreign investment in order to promote um, uh, development. But unfortunately, uh, it didn't go ahead due to political unrest as usual. Um, uh, in Sudan and in, in the year 2012, uh, it was um, statistics from uh, the IMF have shown that uh, the amount of debt outstanding at that time was 79 billion. And this amount um, has um, constituted um, uh, 150, 150% of the GDP uh, and, and like uh, figures like 1,697 
of, um, of exports and of revenue. And all this, uh, of course, um, hinders or pre and prevents um, any, any type of uh, development. Uh, and as a result, Sudan has become, um, had the reputation of being one of the most highly in that countries in Africa. And it ranked the 46 um, in the world. And here, unfortunately for Sudan, the only rising and escalating graph or figure is the loan. This graph is uh, from the World Bank and it shows uh, the amount and uh, the scale of the of loans to Sudan. And unfortunately, um, the in initial figure is 15 billions, but the 86% of those billions uh, of the are arrears and um, penalties for late payment. Yes, and uh, I found very interesting literature, economic literature from Sudan um, concerning the impact of um, uh, of loan um, um, distress, um, uh, loan unsustainability or loan distress on the economy. And uh, for example, Dr. Ahmad in 08, 2008, he found that um, how debt distress impacted on the per capita income and, um, and poverty as well, it had negative effect. And as well on the exchange rate to the, the exchange rate to debt and the, even the foreign um, direct invest, uh, investment to debt, they all had, had a negative impact on the gross domestic product. S similar results as well um, came from Medani, but before that, uh, Dr. Abdel Malwa, Abdel Maula, uh, he suggested uh, that in order uh, I mean to improve on the status of the economy, it's better to for the government to adopt um, an export oriented um, um, strategy for that that is orienting uh, uh, all all type of investments towards exports. And we will see is, is the case of Sudan later how investment uh, and exports have worked very well as well. But during this period of debt distress on Sudan during the 1990s, um, the, uh, the, the first part, the first decade, during the first decade, 1990 until 1995, uh, there was no direct foreign investment in Sudan at all, uh, according to figures. Uh, it, it only started to rise in 1996 with the production of petrol and it rose to 0 0.7 million. And, uh, and then uh, we ended up by the, uh, between the 1998 to, uh, and the year 2006, uh, Sudan has witnessed uh, the third highest invest, uh, inv attraction of foreign direct investment in Africa. And this was of course due to oil production at the time. Although at the time uh, the Sudan was on the, that uh, list of uh, terror of, um, uh, as we all know uh, that we have, I think they've left recently. And, and those investments, foreign direct investment, they came from China mainly China and Asia and maybe, maybe regional countries the, like the Saudi Arabia and uh, the United Arab Emirates. And um, here, uh, this graph as well, it shows uh, because uh, Sudan initially was not um, an oil exporter, uh, but uh, agro pastoral uh, economy. But in uh, this decade of the 90s and the 2000s, uh, it has seen a, a big jump uh, in the uh, petrol exports, uh, although um, at the time uh, the country was in, uh, um, in political difficulties and it was on the list of, of terror. Uh, um, other, uh, you know, Sudan uh, is not in this alone as well, because uh, uh, evidence has found that other African countries as well, they suffered the same. Um, how indebtedness, how debt distress would have a negative impact on economic development.
And uh, the reason that was found, they found that mainly these countries, like we said in the beginning, uh, they orient most of their investments towards consumption or um, um, balancing their books instead of uh, orienting them towards development and investments or exports. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the, the problem of debt is not Sudanese alone. Um, it, it's worldwide and uh, especially poor countries, uh, people have been trying to understand why, for example, in Latin America uh, and Africa, uh, the countries uh, they've done so bad uh, regarding debt and debt rescheduling, why debt resch rescheduling is not popular. But uh, the reason was found that due to um, poor management and um, uh, poor institutions as well, and uh, corruption as well, uh, that has um, prevented the, the, the use of um, foreign direct investments in the right place. As well, the financial crisis of the 2000 in Sudan, uh, because when it took place, the financial crisis, uh, the, the government, uh, the regime at the time, um, um, had sold even uh, the, uh, the government assets in, in that's what we, I found from reading the assets from, from the state, uh, from the all state owned um, businesses and enterprises. The government has sold all the assets and came the financial crisis and uh, as well exports drop and although at the time um, the, the the session of South Sudan didn't take place, but maybe um, um, uh, the financial crisis was an enhancer as well uh, towards the, uh, the split. Of course, the financial crisis, um, uh, we've been trying to understand the financial crisis in the 1980s and 90s and how they impacted on economic growth as well in Latin America and Africa. And although uh, the crises were of different nature to the 2008 crisis, but still um, uh, poor management and, and wrong intervention from um, international uh, bodies, lending bodies that has, be, has led to the, uh, to the exacerbation of the crisis. And um, as well, the crisis in, uh, in, in Europe in the 1990s, in Russia and in Brazil, they were of different nature, but uh, they led, the rescheduling has led, um, not the rescheduling, but they have led to the outflow of capital from those, um, those countries. Um, then came um, yeah, the peace agreement in 2005 and the peace agreement uh, between the SPLM and the uh, regime at the time. Uh, and it has paved the way for the HIPC. The HIPC is the um, a program of for heavily indebted uh, poor countries. Uh, and um, why is Sudan wanted to join the HIPC? Because it offers um, um, a diversity of um, uh, capital inflows into the country in order to um, uh, promote development. Uh, but still, since that time, the country has failed to meet the criteria. And um, at the later, when the session came uh, between um, Sudan and South Sudan, uh, uh, um, it was agreed what was on the table uh, the division, uh, uh, the, the, not the division, but the loan between the two countries was agreed, uh, was supposed to be shared, but still uh, both countries, they uh, uh, failed to reach um, a, a, an agreement on this. And, uh, but at the end, um, uh, Sudan um, has, um, has claimed to keep the entirety of the, of the loan uh, provided that it would have support from South Sudan to access the HIPC program. The HIPC program, um, um, like we said, um, uh, 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 it's, um, 
uh, a lot of homework needs to be done by both countries in order to access to the program and a rescheduling to be agreed upon. And what they have agreed on, yes, both Sudan and South Sudan, they agreed on the zero option. Um, if then, if entry, if Sudan's entry into the HIPC program is not agreed, then uh, they could renegotiate uh, again and uh, negoti- uh, agree on a share of the loan according to international criteria. Of course, uh, South Sudan was born as a, a wealthy and a debt free state. But um, unfortunately, it has um, um, accumulated debt, and uh, but they're still hoping for international debt uh, cancellation. Um, and all of this, uh, of course, is uh, due to, to, to bad management uh, and, and weak institutions, the same like in, uh, in, in North Sudan. And uh, what the revolution has done, has, has given to Sudan, it has given um, um, a historic opportunity for the country uh, to reestablish its relationships with the world, uh, with the donor uh, entities as well, and, um, and um, make a progress with a, um, a large um, macroeconomic reform. And then, um, 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 and to, in order to be able to benefit from what HIPC uh, program uh, uh, suggests. Uh, why HIPC? Uh, uh, because at this point in time, uh, where the situation has reached, uh, Sudan has no other alternative for the time being. It, uh, and um, as an evidence from economic literature as well suggests that the, the, the reduction of stock of external debt uh, would impact uh, with um, um, a, an increase of per capita income of 1% at least. And, uh, and if debt is properly serviced within a country, we could even see a zero, another 0.5% increase in, in income. And, and uh, as well, of course, uh, homework needs to be done by the government. A big homework is ensuring the macroeconomic stability and uh, being uh, allowing, uh, and it's the most difficult part, I think, for countries that are suffering from uh, corruption and weak institutions and uh, political disagreements all the time, like in our case in Sudan. Um, uh, As well, um, I think the country has started implementing the uh, the structure adjustment program uh, for the IMF and has normalized its relations with the regional donors and uh, international ones as well. And um, um, most importantly, uh, they need to revise and visit the ru- laws and rules for foreign direct investment within the country uh, and, and to be directed, uh, to direct the inflows direct for more productive and more efficient uh, and, and uh, more labor intensive, allow la- um, uh, creating jobs and most important because Sudan has the latest figures show that uh, uh, 49% of the population are unemployed, and most of them are young people uh, below 30 years old. Yes, uh, because uh, the positive point that Sudan has concerning the HIPC is that uh, we had experience with the, the, the structural adjustment program as it has been implemented before many times, but it failed. And this time, as it's the last resort, so it has to to get through. Yes, uh, the government still has a homework to do, um, big homework, and it's uh, maintaining political and economic stability. And um, in order to ensure that the capital, external capital inflows would be directed to the right sectors and and benefited from. And of course, um, 
and uh, the inflow the inflow of external debt would impact positively on uh, on price level exchange rate and the balance of payment if well managed um, and of course sudan is now eligible after uh, the 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 after the revolution and the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the revolution and all the political process that has been going on and the peace, recently the peace agreement signed in Juba and uh, it's now eligible uh, for debt relief. They're all awaiting the good news, uh, provided that of course, uh, we have to work hard on poverty uh, alleviation to ensure the, the, the I mean, the benefit of the HIPC entry. Uh, hope is always in the air, the despite the difficulties, but the historical revolution has offered uh, great uh, hope uh, for the people of Sudan uh, to firstly to solve their indebtedness, uh, outside indebtedness and uh, um, the machine of progress um, um, in the country because uh, the last 30 years um, have been really difficult years for the people of Sudan uh, and uh, uh, it has led to large miseries and uh, now uh, there is great potential in Sudan for development, uh, great diversity as well in the economy and um, um, uh, uh, and despite the difficulties but uh, we only have hope, and um, and I think uh, Sudanese people, I believe uh, Sudanese people, have understood the lesson. Um, it's it's ballots, not bullets, <laughs> that will pave the future for uh, for all of us. Yeah. So I stop here. Well, thank you very much, Iman. You really yeah. dealt with quite a lot of you know questions regarding the economic situation of Sudan now, and you recommended various policies to improve the conditions. Um, just before, for I just got, perhaps you could elaborate on a couple of questions. I have not questioned, but point one, you mentioned about unemployment among the young in particular. This yeah. has been going on for some decades, it's not yeah. just only this. Mm -hmm. Secondly, taxation, mm -hmm. particularly outside Khartoum or mm -hmm. outside civil service. Mm -hmm. Not much taxation is paid for no. this day. No. And thirdly, there is not much to export. Cotton has gone. Gum yeah. Arabic is negligible. Mm -hmm. You know, say how, you know, Sudan kind of pledge its economy for further loans. Mm -hmm. Who is going to give Sudan loans if there is nothing to mm -hmm. export to earn some money? Mm -hmm. and, and last point, which perhaps we need, is mm -hmm. dependency on outside donors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The economy depends on Saudi Arabia, on the United yeah, Arab Emirates, yes. or internet. Yeah. There is nothing, you know, say, generate within the Sudan mm -hmm. to be slightly independent from those outside donors. Yeah. So perhaps you could elaborate very briefly before yeah, we uh, and I believe this is the legacy, the dependency on the regional donors. Yes. Um, you know, um, all the world depends on Saudi Arabia, but for us, um, for Sudan, it's not good because it mm. will impact on the political uh, uh, parcours, you know, on the political course of our uh, of our government. And um, for the Saudi Arabia, Egypt, um, they're not in favor of... Um, uh, a, a democratic government in Sudan. They've always um, worked against what we had before. So, and this time already um, the legacy of Bashir and the Yemen war and the people who go to fight are from uh, Sudan, young people from Sudan. This is despair, of course. And, um, and um, that's why the actual government is having difficulty getting out of this, um, I mean, um, uh, seizure. <laughs> They're seized by the region. And uh, uh, the, the main thing, and of course, corruption is still ruling and um, uh, it's great corruption and uh, that uh, we inherited. And uh, those people are, uh, I mean, the military part, they, they, they won't give up like this. <laughs> 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 but concerning exports, um, 
uh, still uh, there is a great, um, uh, great, how do you call it, um, the livestock in Sudan. We have like 170 mil millions of them. And now the military are, um, w are exporting uh, millions without getting through the books of, uh, uh, of the uh, Ministry of Finance. Uh, they export it to Egypt and um, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, I think, because and they built like um, abattoir. How do you say this? The very modern abattoirs for for slaughtering <laughs> and exporting uh, um, uh, those organic yeah, uh, livestock. Yeah. Iman Azhari, Allah mm -hmm. he died penniless. Even his house was built yes. by contribution from people. Yeah. And Bashir was caught up in his home millions and millions. Millions behind, yeah, below. You could see the difference between yeah. how, the quality. Well, exactly. The mm. sort of people now running the Sudan <laughs> there and then. Well, mm -hmm. thank you very much, Iman, You're for welcome. your contribution. I'm sure there are you know, questions to be asked mm. for you. Now I turn. We've got two more speakers, Johara yeah. and Peter. I turn to Peter, uh, Hakeem Justin, who, is, who has been in our conferences in Oxford before, and we thank him for uh, joining us. Peter completed his studies in Juba University and in Holland. Um, he is a researcher. He is an economist interest in governance, conflict studies, and land tenure in Africa. He very kindly sent me his article on his contribution today. And I will ask Peter whether he would like me to circulate this or keep it to myself later on, um, because it's a very good study indeed about the problem of land in South Sudan. Uh, Peter, being consultant in, in, many, in many spheres, as well as published a great deal, and today, He's going to talk to us on really very, you know, issue. I remember some years back, I met some barrier people in London, and he said, Juba is ours. There's nothing to do with, you know, with the other Southern Sudanese. And you could see that how tribal um, historical uh, <coughs> settlement is in conflict with the modern requirement of a state. And even to the point what uh, Salva Kiir trying to move the capital from Juba to somewhere else because of this contention over land ownership in Juba. But anyhow, I leave that to you, Peter, to talk to us for 20 minutes or so. So thank you. Go ahead, Peter, thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for the kind words and uh, for giving me the opportunity to come and talk once again. <laughs> Yeah, I remember some time back, you also did invite me to give a talk on land governance in Oxford, which I happily did. And uh, once again, I'm doing it today. Uh, and maybe to begin with, the, let me uh, alert you that actually the idea of sharing with you the document is so that to share with everybody who is interested. Um, actually, uh, when uh, when you contacted me to, with the question whether I can give a talk on land, then I thought, okay, maybe let me develop that document. So that document is specifically developed for this purpose. So please feel free to share with everybody. Yeah, so the, the topic of the discussion is land tenure or land governance and conflict in South Sudan. So uh, I just decided to approach it as an analysis issue, actually trying to look into the literature in terms of what has been said or what has been happening on land in South Sudan. Uh, specifically from the start of the CPA in 2005 this way. And of course, you can't talk of land or conflict after the CPA without reflecting into the past. So that is why it's trying to understand what has been happening from CPA onwards with an understanding of what was happening in the past. So just to give you a background, uh, maybe to start with okay, the, the concept or the idea of uh, uh, land tenure, Land tenure, generally speaking, is a system of institutions, rules, and the use or management. And it denotes how land is used and managed. So generally speaking, land tenure is said to be secure when, for example, landowners know or 
when people know how to access land, when you have disputes, where to take these disputes, and uh, when there are general conflicts, how to resolve them. So land tenure is insecure when it is difficult to resolve this. For example, if you don't know how to own land, if you have problems, you don't know where to take it, and even if there are institutions, usually there are dilemmas in terms of how these are resolved. So in this case, we talk of uh, insecure land tenure. So linking this to the comprehensive peace agreement, uh, actually, as we are aware, the bigger part of the peace agreement was to address uh, the grievances that caused the civil war, that the North-South civil war, which was ended actually through this agreement. And that, that actually also marked the starting point for state building in South Sudan. So the, the main focus of the CPA was to address the grievances or the presumed or the actual grievances that caused those wars. And mainly it was the question of marginalization and then the land question, of course. Um, and how did the government in South Sudan and the donors try to address this? Uh, they came up in terms of the marginalization, they built on the the war time slogan developed by SPLM, which was taking towns to the uh, taking towns to, to, to the people or to the villages. Um, and then the other one is the land belongs to the people. So the argument was those are the main causes of the civil war. So addressing it should be a major component of the state building. And the base on that actually they came with what they call the decentralized system of governance, which includes also that reform. Uh, but as the process of state building was going on, with the decentralization and land governance or land reform still going on, South Sudan started witnessing different levels of conflicts. Uh, sometimes even in areas where which were a bit relative, which were relatively peaceful even before the CPA, and that actually raised a number of questions. So if you can go to the second slide. Uh, and then the main question which we thought can be of interest is, for example, to what extent are the conflicts connected to state building? Because actually, the South, Sud South Sudanese and the South Sudanese Authority and the international donors were trying to help the people of South Sudan to build the state. Then, but at the same time, and the state building ultimately would actually strive for to, to improve the institutions so that the, country, the state can be able to control its border deliver services. And, but what was happening was the exact opposite. So the question is to what extent are this conflict connected to state building? Because state building is supposed to contribute to peace, but now it's contributing to conflict. And there may be more specifically, what patterns of conflict did we observe during uh, the start of the CPA? To what extent are these conflicts are connected to decentralization and land reform? And uh, is there any connection between these conflicts and history? And uh, what does this mean to the country? So if we go to the next slide, please. Then uh, actually here, okay, then again, uh, the, the article then tried to look, or the analysis issue actually tried to look for the post-CPA state building and the conflict dynamics. So in terms of, okay, what are the type of conflicts that erupted? Like we say, it actually a conflict almost hit most part of the country, including those that have been relatively peaceful during the civil war. And uh, the conflict comprised of all the conflicts, known all the conflicts, for example, which came about, for example, as a result of competition between uh, cattle herders on grazing land or water sources. But then new conflicts emerged, mainly on land rights, on borders, on uh, new claims on territory like uh, Ahmed mentioned at the introductory section whereby some communities will say that this is our land, you belong to the other areas. So these are the new dy dynamics of conflicts which were not there before. And then, though, like I said, though the causes of the conflicts were multifaceted, but then the land question was playing a very big role on this. And more problematic is that a failure in resolving conflicts at the local level then was making, making it very easy for small scale conflicts to escalate to become to community and then from community sometimes then to political. And then, uh, of course, like I mentioned earlier, decentralization and land reform were very central 
uh, to this state building project. And then to what extent are this conflict connected to decentralization and land reform? So maybe I thought in the analysis issue, I thought, okay, we should reflect on how the state building was actually structured. First of all, we have the government structure at the start of the CPA, which comprised of 10 states, and the states are divided to lower levels of governance, uh, called the county, and then counties to Payams and the Bomas. In 2013, as we know, civil law broke out, and then contestation started. Of course, that uh, the fight which started in Juba and then ended up with the formation of SPLMIO as a rebel movement. And then SPLMIO came up with an idea that we want to change the number of the states. Uh, in a state of 10, we want it to be 21. And the logic of the 21, it builds on the 21 districts left by the British colonial authority when they left Sudan in 1956. Later on, the National Salvation Front, which for some reason they abbreviated as NAS, I was expecting it to be NAF, <laughs> NSF. So the National Salvation Front actually, when it formed the movement, then they say, okay, no, we also want a decentralized system of govern governance based on federalism. And the federalism should be based on the three regions of Equatoria, Upper Nile, and Bahar Ghazal that existed before the start of the North-South Civil War in 1983. So while these contestations were going on, the land reform was going on also. But then the problem is uh, the fact that the land reform, the land reform is linked to the structure of the government. So when we had 10 states and 79 counties, that means land reform was, the national land reform was to be decentralized to state land, uh, uh, to state land authorities, and then it goes back down to Payam and Bomas. So the more you change these structures, the more actually you confuse the whole system, uh, making at some point actually making it, making the country not to have land institutions in some areas. And that, that confusion actually defined the types of conflicts that emerge after the CPA. So we have, okay, people talk generally of land conflict, but if you critically look at them, you can group them to political conflict, and in this case, political land conflict are mainly the competition between different authorities or different groups in terms of what kind of governance should be the structure. Because when you talk of structure of government, when you talk of number of states, when you talk of counties, you're talking of borders, you're talking of territories, and that means you're talking about land. And then you have the governance conflict related to land. You know, the land reform actually led to, because the argument is, the land system that existed was partly, con partly contributed to the conflict. So the way to resolve that is actually to change it. So the new land reform partly replaced the, the land governing institutions and authority that existed in the pre-CPA conflict, in the, the pre-CPA period. And that by itself became a source of conflict, competition between the new and the old. In the villages, you know, SPLA appointed chiefs who, who were replacing the traditional land custodians who actually who have been there. So this by itself brought another type of conflict. And then we have community conflict. Again, the, the structuring of the, the creation of the states and the divisions of county, Payams and the Bomas had followed an ethnic line. So that idea of a given ethnic group should be in charge of a given territory became very popular. Uh, which Ahmed again mentioned earlier that, you know, like the Bari say, Juba belongs to Bari and the Mundari would tell you that Terekeka belongs to, uh, Terekeka belongs to Mundari. So that by itself then brings the question of community, which community owns which piece of land and has resulted to many conflicts actually. I've published a number of papers actually on that, which I'm happy to share with those who are interested. So, 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 that brought actually a number of conflicts in terms of which community owns which one. And then we have local conflicts. The local conflicts are mainly what we would call, local land conflicts are mainly what we would call, for example, dispute on land ownership and all this. But then again, there have been challenges in terms of which laws uh, should, which laws should be able to resolve conflicts. For example, if uh, there are disputes between, for example, returnees, and the IDPs who have been uh, occupying their lands. Returnees would say that, you know what, this land was given to me by the legal authority of Sudan before the civil war. 
So I want my land back and this are my papers and others will say that, no, you know what? You ran SPLA, liberated this area. So these are the new rules and uh, these are the new laws. So I'm given by the most legitimate authority. And challenges in addressing those conflicts at the lower level usually makes it very easy for to escalate to from individual to community and then from community sometimes becomes goes to even a political level and then uh, the paper tries to see okay uh, to what extent okay what, what does history tells us about all this confusion or all this uh, classes about governance okay maybe very quickly by returning from the cpa period backwards up to the start of the 19th century uh, what became sudan before the separation of south sudan was an uh, you know collection of different kingdoms and territories pioneered first by the Ottoman Empire because they needed slaves. So the more areas they were able to bring together, the more slaves they could get. Uh, unfortunately, the authorities that or the other policies that follow actually just follow the same rule. After the end of colonialism, of course, the period of Mahdi came and then went, and then the British colonial uh, authority came in. And in this case, it basically, though it went with an idea of you know, the three C's, that is civilization, Christianity, and the commerce, but they ended up actually doing the same thing some of the uh, slave traders were doing by, you know, playing about with the ter territories, bringing, uh, for example, Equatoria, most parts of the eastern or eastern, uh, western part of the Nile in Equatoria used to be part of the Congo, Belgium, or part what was used to be called a Lado enclave, and they became only part of the current South Sudan in 1910. Uh, brought about by the British colonial authority. The same thing we have South Sudan under the close district rule was governed as a different territory. But before independence, this rule decided, or the, the colonial authority decided to hand it over to Sudan. The same thing with Darfur, which was a separate kingdom, became part of Sudan only in 1916. So, after the end of colonialism, of course, post colonial government did just exactly the same. Omar al Nimeri in 1983 decided to abolish the Addis Ababa Agreement and uh, divided South to three regions, which partly contributed to the conflict. And during the war, Omar al Bashir did the same. You know, as a strategy for divide and rule, decided to replace the three provinces in South Sudan by 10 states. And on the other hand, SPLA was doing the same, trying to create counties and the bombers, arguably, for the transfer of power from military to civilian uh, rule. But in fact, they have been using those territories for getting resources and the conscription of youth for fighting the government. So, so if you closely look at this, I hope, uh, how long do I have still? Um, at least another five minutes, if you like. Okay, that, that, that should be okay. <laughs> that should be okay. So. If you, if you closely look at this, the creation of territories or the creation of what became South Sudan actually was based on violence. It's a result of violence. So uh, and then to what extent is this reflected or to what extent is this history of violence reflected to the violence that we see after the start of the CPA? So if we again look at, uh, you know, like as I mentioned at the start, if you talk about the structure of the government in South Sudan, we talk about the 10 states, which later on their proposals for 21 and then their proposals for three regions. So if we look at this, you know, it's, it's just basically building on the same idea where how uh, those involved in slave trade or, or colonialism and even later post-colonial government behave. You know, they, they, they have been, they, they argue that the creation of the territories is to improve service delivery to local people. But in fact, that has not been the case. If you critically look at the claims, for example, made by each of the main three actors, we have SPLMIO, we have uh, NAS, we have the government. Each, uh, for, uh, NAS, for example, if you critically look at the three regions that they're talking about, it goes back to the debate on uh, federalism, which started in 2012. This debate was triggered by the governors of the three states that we want federal system of governance based on the three regions. What was the cause? If you look at it, the cause was simply because the central government in Juba decided to centralize revenue collection. 
And for those governors, they thought that maybe federalism would give them the authority so that they can be able to reclaim, they can be able to reclaim, for example, revenue collection. And that the same idea, actually, even NAS idea of federalism later on builds on, on the same idea of the three regions. So if you critically look at it, it's more of a political move than really aimed at service delivery. The same thing, SPLM-IO may be more opportunistic in this case by you know, looking first into how to get alliance and seeing that Equatorians are already busy with the question of federalism, maybe this is an opportunity talking about federalism based on 21 states maybe can be able to attract political and military support from Equatoria because especially when the conflict initially was seen the conflict that started in 2013, when it was seen as conflict between Dinka and Noel. So for IO, actually attracting political and military support from Equatorial federalism would be a tool. And the secondly, the 21 states will also give SPLM IO actually more territories, especially in the oil, in the, the oil areas. Um, government, the same thing, the changes from 10 to 28 and then 32 states and recently back to 10, the whole idea is just a political maneuver to create more territories to reward patronage systems so that they can be able he can be able to get support so in in, in conclusion uh, what does all this mean uh, unfortunately okay state building in south sudan had taken top down approach in which they thought uh, what the people of south sudan need can be engineered from up and then you just feed up they, they thought okay we need federalism and then boom we need land reform and then boom but th what does that mean uh, there was a total neglect on history. For example, if actors to state building were to critically look into how the structure of the government they supported came about, they could have been at least cautious and they may be involved more in negotiations and more engagement to see in terms of what was the best system of governance. Because basically what was negotiated or what was implemented in South Sudan was agreement between Omar al-Bashir and uh, and his counterparts in South Sudan. It did not involve the people of South Sudan. It did not involve even uh, some of the armed groups which are fighting at the, uh, by the, that time. And uh, decentralization actually, okay, it's argued that decentralization was to take power and resources to the people. But what basically happened in South Sudan is that the government used decentralization to recentralize. And the evidence is almost most chiefs in government control areas appointed by the party. Uh, the same thing you have governors, commissioners, all this. So, what is actually claimed as decentralization in South Sudan, I would call it recentralization. So, uh, because of the little attention paid to history, unfortunately, state building in South Sudan ended up bringing the same institutions that caused the violence that they're trying to stop. So, let me stop here. Uh, and uh, if there are questions and others, maybe I will just yeah. look at them later. Thank you very much. Well, Peter, thank you very much indeed about the, your presentation and its implication in the economy of South Sudan. Just very briefly, uh, before I turn to Johara, <clears throat> I remember my research in Northern Sudan that 1898, the British came and, and as far as the economy of the North saying, well, if you claim your land, you have to prove through the Sharia that you own land. Any land which you cannot prove to be your the ownership, it will revert to the state. And hence, registration of land became extremely important for two reasons. One is for taxation, and secondly, for investment. Mm -hmm. And the, the economy of the river and people has really took off because of the individual ownership. And I, my question here, you talk about decentralization, has anything has been done to register land in individual names rather than what they call common land among tribes or whatever? Um, very briefly, I don't want to. Okay, very briefly. Again, yeah. Um, yes, the point you mentioned, the, the, the idea of registration of land in the North, actually, it, unfortunately, again, it, it's the land registration ordinance of 1925 that you're referring to. And that ordinance gives right for land registration in the North and a few rural areas and a few urban areas in South Sudan, not in villages. 
So um, if you continue, then in 1970, then there is the, the Unregistered Land Act, which actually builds on this. Any land not registered according to this 1925 land registration ordinance belongs to the state. That means most rural areas in South Sudan belong to the state. And that partly contributed to the conflict. Yes. So then the question is, uh, in South Sudan, is land being registered or does it make sense for land to be registered? Honestly speaking, okay, if, if you look at the conflict that I mentioned in South Sudan, actually there has never been a peaceful period for which, you know, things like, you know, more attention to be paid for the land question whether it should be registered or not and how, for example, community land, in terms of how it should be registered. Uh, what they did at the most was to develop the Land Act of 2009, which actually up to now is the official Land Act in South Sudan. Uh, and uh, the development of that Land Act, if you look at it, say we the people of South Sudan, uh, based on the consultation, but who did they consult? They consulted county commissioners and the chiefs. Who are these chiefs? These chiefs are the very chiefs who are appointed by the government. So basically you are consulting the government to ask what kind of land should I so what is reflected in the Land Act of 2009 is basically the idea of the government. And that is why there is tension between the community and the government in terms of uh, who owns the land. And if you look, if you critically look at uh, what is happening, for example, initially during the war, the government was talking the land belongs to the people, the land belongs to the community. But now if you look at the constitution, it says, Land in South Sudan belongs to the people of South Sudan, but its usage shall be regulated by the state, which means actually the government is going back to the 1970 Land Act, which gives the land to the state, or maybe going back to the 1925 land ordinance, which says your land is not registered, it belongs to the state. Uh, good. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Now we turn to our last speaker, Johara, and she is an economist. She was trained for her postgraduate studies at um, Bradford University in development, finance and development. She works as a program officer for at the United States Institute for Peace and a founding member of the Sudanese Women Economists Association. She is really interested in development field in Sudan and in the region. Uh, Johar is an active community member who tirelessly work as empowering women in particular. So Johara, um, you are going to talk about Sudan public sector in institutions. Uh, will the international capacity um, gap hinder Sudan political and economic transition? So we look forward to hear your take on this. Thank you, Johara, off you go. I'm very glad you were able to join us. Thanks. You have about 20 minutes. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, and thank you for inviting me here today. I'm glad to be in this platform with so many distinguished uh, people and looking forward to the discussion later with our um, participants as well. I would like to speak about, um, as you mentioned, uh, if I may just share my screen and, and it would be great if someone could confirm that my screen is showing. That's showing. Thank you. Perfect. So I'll be talking about Sudan's public sector institutions and whether the, uh, the institutional capacity gap can hinder or uh, make Sudan's political and economic trans transition a reality. Um, basically, um, basically, the idea is that um, I'll try and start by identifying what do we expect from the transitional government of Sudan as it is, and then how can we or how can we analyze this institution's ability to make um, this role of the government a reality. When I'm talking about institutions, I talk about the public sector institutions um, at different levels, um, be it like at the central government level or at the state level government uh, governance level, um, uh, and not only the financial institutions um, as, as, as we know them, um, just to make myself clear here. Um, to start with, um, as you know, um, Sudan has been going, uh, has been undergoing this transitional period for, for some time now and is expected to prolong, uh, hopefully for, for not too long. Um, and um, from what I see and from what expected uh, from the Sudanese people and as per the constitutional document, the transitional government of Sudan with its both arm, the military and the civilian arm, is expected to um, lay the foundations of a peaceful power transition is expected to uh, foster a sustainable peace, and it's expected to foster access to transitional government and to stimulate economic growth. 
as uh, many of you know that um, economic conditions have been one of the main reasons um, the revolution um, started in Sudan back in 2018. And it's one of the reasons that um, people continue to take on the streets and so on. The economic dilemma has been um, tackled by previous panelists. So I would like to just, um, yeah, um, to go further with this point. Um, so my po the point that I'm trying to ask or trying to solve here is to what extent are the pre existing ex institutions of the government are capable of, of uh, implementing the previously mentioned um, uh, the previously mentioned points, which are like uh, a peaceful transition of power, sustainable peace, access to transitional government, and economic growth. Um, to start with, um, there is a prevalent concept uh, concept with, within the field of political economy and within uh, institutions is that institutions. Uh, have a tendency um, to do nothing or to remain unchanged, meaning that previous factors um, of institutional capacity usually tend to have more effect on their current performance. Meaning that if you would like to change um, the, the government effectiveness in a country or um, uh, the corruption status in, the, in a country, it's most likely to be um, a long process uh, and it's most likely, um, yeah, it's most likely to not see its effect like in the, in the near future and so on. I'm showing a simple graph at the moment that shows um, to what extent is this affected by past institutions, as I've mentioned. Um, so as you can see on this graph, it's about the political economy um, and how it's affected and of, of institutions and how it's affected by past and present interplay. Um, the current political economic sphere, as you can see on the top of the, of the, of the graph here, um, is affecting the institutional reform and it's affected by previous institutional heritage. And it's rather a gear, so each one of them affects the, the other one. Uh, for this reason in particular, uh, I'd like to start um, or to uh, embark by the institutional history of the Sudan institutions. So I would give a brief historical overview of the performance of the um, public sector institutions in Sudan across history. And um, yeah, I would like to hear like uh, from the audience about their uh, perspectives on the different eras as well. Um, I will uh, specifically focus on the um, on on what we know as the modern Sudan, uh, which is like the shape of the Sudanese country as we know it. Um, so I'll start by the Turkey Egyptian um, rule. Um, it's true that so the area of or the piece of land that we call Sudan had previous kingdoms and. Um, and, and, and groups living there before the Turkey Egyptian Sudan, but this is what we define as the modern shape of, of, of the current Sudan. So I'll start from there. During the Turkey Egyptian rule in Sudan, as, as many of you might know, um, it was rather an extractive rule. So there was no particular focus uh, put on building institutions. Um, um, the Turks and Egyptians didn't really care about um, building a state. Um, they rather wanted to extract like uh, manpower, um, resources and, and, and wealth to use them in other countries that um, they've been colonizing and stuff. So uh, the idea of building institutions like for rule of law, uh, institutions of uh, effectiveness and so on wasn't really an issue. And um, even if it was existing, it was brief and limited to the, to the extent that serves the, the, the colonizers uh, agenda and so on. Um, during the Mahdist era, um, the institutions were again, um, there was some sort of, um, uh, it was different in terms of um, that it has some national agenda to it. However, there, is, uh, there wasn't a really significant uh, process, progress made in institutional building. And this was due to many factors that the Mahdist, uh, the Mahdist state was facing too many internal and external wars. And that um, in, in some areas, it was mainly um, rather, um, I would say not, um, not as inclusive as it should be for building of state. Further, further down the road is the Andrew Egyptian Sudan. Um, and, and here I would like to refer to them to the paper by um, Darren Ashimeglu, Simon Johnson, and James Robinson uh, of 2001, uh, which is talking about the colonial er origins of comparative development. So mainly the theory that, that the authors uh, pose here is that um, in areas where colonizers in general uh, experience less mortality rates, these were the areas where um, colonizers uh, managed to establish well-grounded uh, institutions and, 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 and vice versa. So in areas where, um, um, like for instance, let's talk about the British colonization. If they arrive to a land that um, uh, happened to have like natural situations that led to uh, high mortality rates, it was less likely for them to settle and, and establish institutions. If we are to reflect this on the Sudanese experience, um, Overall, um, again, it was it was a it was a colony. So at the end of the day, the 
whatever institution that was built there, it was to serve them the benefits of the colonizer. However, um, the British did manage to establish a few institutions um, that uh, that were well grounded. They um, they they had um, uh, some capacitated staff again to serve a certain purpose, and so on. And if we were to reflect Asimoglos and um, and his uh, colleagues' um, theory here, we'd see that um, in Northern Sudan, where the British people experienced less mortality rates, they managed to establish more durable institutions. However, in Southern Sudan at the time, um, mortality rates could have been higher due to, um, to the natural conditions there, to humidity, um, to prevalent of of diseases and so on, um, and and to the to the uh, to the natural con conditions overall, so it, it could lead to um, to, uh, to a, a conclusion that that's the reason why at the beginning um, colonizers couldn't settle and and consequently couldn't like establish uh, extractive institutions, even though the the region was was quite rich and and, and full of um, of wealth and so on. Uh, far for, forward down the road, uh, we arrived to the era of post-independent Sudan. Um, this area mainly um, relied on the on the heritage of the of the of the previous um, colonizers in terms of institutions. Um, Sudan was a was a new state trying to uh, to 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 take its baby steps towards um, towards uh, growth and towards um, establishing institutions and so on. However, many 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 factors internally and externally affected this process. Um, in the first twenty years after the independence, it was mainly war, internal uh, internal uh, coups, and 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 revolutions and so on. And after we arrived to the area to the era of, of the of the salvation regime or, or, or the or, or the previous regime as we know it, um, in this area not only has institutions witnessed um, a setback or drawback to, to their performances, they were rather systematically uh, dismantled and they were systematically um, destroyed. Uh, for instance, um, projects such as the, the Jazeera scheme, um, such as uh, projects such as um, the National Port of Sudan and so on, uh, were, were, were destroyed either by, by, by the regime's um, systematic empowerment um, scheme by replacing their cadre into the existing uh, professional cadre of, of these institutions or by uh, prevalent corruption. So the corruption played very, uh, a big role in terms of um, destroying institutions and so on. A more recent look into Sudan's institutions, um, uh, and for this purpose, I would like to refer, by, uh, to, refer to certain data. Um, to show Sudan's performance in terms of governance, institutions, and so on, um, outlining different factors and to, to uh, explain more on, on, on the current performance. If I may share my screen again, just to show the graphs. So um, here on this graph, um, uh, and this data is extracted from the Ibrahim, um, Ibrahim Index of African Governance, and it's an index that has been um, examining the performance of uh, economic opportunities, human development, uh, access to rule of law um, uh, across African countries for, for, for 10 years now. Um, so if you look at the performance of Sudan's overall governance and institutional uh, institutional performance, we see that Sudan is not only below the sub-Saharan Africa average, it's been, um, uh, it's been showing a somehow stable trend um, uh, that hasn't been increasing. Again, uh, here I refer back to my first point, which I mentioned that institutions don't tend to change um, in, a in, a, uh, in a small period of time. And, and and that over this period, and that's why, like, even if there have been any change in the performance of institutions, we wouldn't see the the the, the leaps of it um, in the short term. Another important thing is that um, this time period is partially, uh, or even mostly, uh, was under the rule of the previous regime. So it's no surprise that the institutional governance uh, performance wasn't um, as great as someone would expect it. Um, um, this, this is regarding the overall uh, institutional performance. I've also taken another graph um, showing uh, economic opportunity because as I said, the, the economic dilemma has been a prevalent matter in the Sudanese discourse over the past few years. So in terms of Sudan's performance um, as, a, as, a, as laying foundations for economic opportunity, and, and here I, by economic opportunity, I'm talking about infrastructure, I'm talking about investment, I'm talking about the country's um, willingness to engage uh, with, with the international community and so on. Again, Sudan's performance wasn't uh, great. It is slightly better than its uh, overall governance um, uh, overall governance um, uh, performance. However, it's not something that uh, we can we can rely on as a as a foundation for like uh, good economic opportunities in the future. Started by around thirty four percent, 
and it's been um, moving up and down around the same line. Uh, it's almost um, stable as, as, I've, as I've mentioned before. Um, so this is regarding uh, recent, uh, more recent performance of Sudanese um, uh, institutions um, in, 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 the recent, in the recent period. Um, so, as I've as, so as I've been mentioning, um, Sudan's uh, institutions have been suffering from many, um, from many, um, uh, I would say structural, structural problems regarding uh, corruption, um, uh, uh, lack of gover government effectiveness, uh, lack of access to rule of law and everything. Um, even within other indices as well, uh, such as the Corruption Perception Index, Sudan have been consistently ranking on the bottom 10 countries for the past 10 years uh, globally, meaning that even when we talk about uh, uh, the people's perception of, of, of public corruption in the country, this has been something prevalent and people feel that the country is, is really corrupt, um, that it, it deserves to be ranked um, as, as one of the bottom um, 10 countries globally. All these all this historical nuances and the current performance shows that um, Sudan really hadn't had the chance to um, to lay a constant or, 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 or a strong foundation for institutions. Hence, any change that we plan at the moment or any uh, attempt that we have um, to fix Sudan's institutions at the moment needs to take all these factors into, into, into attention. Factors such as the colonial heritage, factors such as the systematic empowerment of certain people over others, factors such as lack of inclusivity of Sudanese institutions, meaning that uh, focusing on people from certain backgrounds, people from certain ethnicities, and uh, excluding other people and so on and and and, and so on um, so in terms of the four main points which i started the presentation with is what we expect from the transitional government now i'm trying to make the link between um these four um, points or, or roles that we expect from the government and the current institutional capacities that we have so the first point was the uh, was a peaceful power transition uh, to what extent uh, do I think, or do we think that the institutional capacity that's prevalent in Sudan is, is, is able to foster uh, a peaceful power transition? Uh, with the signature of the constitutional document, it was agreed that uh, many commissions uh, would, be, would be established. One of them was the Peace Commission uh, and, and, the, and the Electoral Commission as well. So far, we don't see any progress made in any of this, or a little progress made in some of, in some of their um, steps of establishment. However, we don't see them functionally, uh, functioning, functioning proper, properly so far. Uh, another important thing is, is um, as the extent to which the government or, or, or the transitional government of Sudan have been showing an inclusive approach to a peaceful transition. Uh, we've been hearing many voices uh, from, from different regions from Sudan saying that uh, even with the signature of peace agreements, um, that the people weren't consulted and that the people in the negotiation rooms uh, don't, ne don't necessarily um, uh, speak for, for the people on the ground and so on. And, uh, and I, I, I actually attribute this to the role of institutions. It is on the, on the transitional government to make sure that people are aware of the, of the, of the points of, or, or the points of discussion in these negotiation rooms. And it is on the transitional government to make sure that the outcomes of these negotiations are shared um, across, across the people of Sudan and so on. Another, another thing that I've mentioned before, uh, which is expected from the transitional government, was access to transitional uh, justice. Um, again, the, the, so far we don't see any uh, progress being made in, in, in access to transitional govern, uh, justice because, uh, for instance, uh, people don't necessarily, uh, despite the fact that we do have like some legal reforms and so on, there are still some matters that are undiscussed. Um, uh, people are not aware, and I'm, I'm always emphasizing the fact, uh, the, the point of awareness, because we might be hearing about things here in Khartoum, but when we go outside to other regions and different places, we don't really, uh, uh, just asking regular people on the street, we wouldn't find them aware of whatever decisions that are being made here in Khartoum and so on. So people aren't really aware of these reforms and how it affects them. Uh, and people feel that there are still ways, uh, there are still, uh, there are still um, some cases of matters are, uh, to be where justice needs to be said, like such as the, the, uh, the, 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 the martyrs' rights, um, such as um, uh, uh, dismantling of the previous regime and, and so on, dismantling of the previous regime structures and so on.
another important point which I'd like to talk about is um, is the transitional government's ability to stimulate economic growth and whether with is its current institutions it can it can it can do that or not. I've just illustrated um, the, on the graph that the Sudan's performance when it comes to economic opportunity hasn't been great. Um, hence, um, access to uh, access of foreign investors to Sudan hasn't hasn't been um, uh, easy in the previous three years and and hasn't changed so far. Even with the new draft of the investment law, it doesn't it doesn't really uh, foster uh, an attractive investment environment. Another thing is, um, uh, even within the process of uh, processes processes of investment themselves, they seem to be complicated, and that has been shown in the in the progress of Sudan's ease of doing business and so on. Another important thing when it comes to economic growth is that even with with the economic reforms that have been taking um, taking place in the country and have been uh, championed by the Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank of Sudan, um, they seem to be uh, in many cases lack of. Um, lack of consensus or lack of uh, agreement of the roles of the two institutions, even though theoretically it's, it should be um, clear and, 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 and known to the people that you know, the, minister, the finance ministry will take the, the fiscal rule, role and, and the central bank will take the monitor, monitor role. But again, I would attribute this to the systematic, um, uh, a systematic, uh, I would say, um, uh, this, this uh, the disturbance of the roles of the two institutions hence they still try and navigate their ways um through through this new um this, this new structure and so on um even um for me um to, to illustrate further whether um the the, the current situation in, in 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 the current situation of the institutions can can foster um can foster um, uh, a peaceful transition of power in the future. I would like to use two case studies of prevalent uh, matters in the in the transitional period. The first one would be the, the Sudan Family Support Program, and the second one would be the Juba Peace Agreement. Um, so for the Sudan Family Support Program, um, as many of you would know, it's um, it's a conditional cash transfers, uh, cash transfers, uh, unconditional cash, uh, cash transfers uh, program that's meant to cover 80% of the population as a way of cushioning the, the effects of, of the of the economic reform policies. Um, this program was officially launched on the 24th of February. However, um, However, um, I think or I believe that the institutional capacity of Sudan might hinder this program for many reasons. First, in terms of registration. Uh, so in order for people to access these funds that are meant to be delivered to them, this 80% of the population, they have to be registered through a national ID system, which is, um, which is problematic in itself. Um, it's, it hasn't been uh, very accessible for people in rural areas to, to access registration centers over the year. Uh, uh, this data, even after being registered, they've been uh, captured or, or guarded by the Minister of Interior, not the Minister of Social Affairs. So now these ministries need to coordinate together and uh, to coordinate together in order to like share this information and, and store them correctly. And again, this is problematic because it relates back to government effectiveness in terms of like bureaucracy and so on. Another important matter that that's related to them to the registration of of, uh, of of the family support program is the um, is the consensus, the fact that we had. Uh, our last consensus back in 2014 poses many questions about the real, pop, real number of population across Sudan and whether these people can actually be accessed and whether these figures of people under the poverty line are, are actually reliable or not. Another issue that institutions might, 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 might pose here for in terms of the family support program is the allocation of these funds. Uh, as we all know, Sudan has many nomadic uh, groups that are moving around uh, by nature of their uh, economic activities and so on. It wouldn't be as easy to access these groups as they as they move around. Hence, this leads actually for, for more rooms of, 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 of public corruption because uh, we cannot really trace or track the, the, rec the receiving of these funds across these groups. Uh, my second case study, and I'll try and make it brief, is the Juba Peace Agreement. Um, so the, uh, the Juba Peace Agreement, even though it had um, it managed to bring uh, some sort of a, a, a consensus among groups that hasn't really been uh, gathered, ha hasn't gathered together before, and and it it does put the ground for like um, uh, uh, it does put uh, some ground for sustainable peace, um, uh, just achieving sustainable peace in Sudan despite our our uh, its shortcomings and so on. Uh, it is hindered by the by the establishment of the peace commission. It, it's hindered by the federal government governance structures and whether um, structures at the locality level and at the state level are capable of of of, of implementing the the Juba peace agreements. 
It's also uh, hindered by the by the level of which the states are able to re reallocate um, revenues and rehab rehabilitate uh, the infrastructures to attract investments and and hence like reverse them the the, the the effects of of war in conflict areas and so on. Another important factor, uh, which is hind very much hindered by both civil and military um, institutions in Sudan, is the reintegration of the armed groups uh, back to the community, whether they're being integrated back into the civil um, service or into, into the military service. Um, the institutions don't seem to have like a proper uh, structure in place to, 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 to absorb this, this uh, um, uh, returnees to, to its capacity be it in terms of uh, uh, skills, be it in terms of uh, employment opportunities and so on. Um, finally, uh, what I would recommend uh, or what I would um, summarize with, again, uh, an important point is that institutions can't change over a day. Hence, uh, if we are to have good institutions uh, after 20 years, we need to start now. Um, uh, the government needs needs to pay more attention to, um, to its institutional capacity in terms of uh, clear division of roles between the state and federal level, um, the state level and the federal level. Um, the government also need to um, uh, to put uh, or to lay the foundation of uh, of anti-corruption mechanism mechanism uh, and to have like clear structures when it comes to uh, structures like along the way, be it legal, um, uh, executive, and so on, when it comes to dismantling the previous regime, and um, the government also needs to uh, show the public. Uh, it's, it's its way of work and so on, so that the government can also be uh, uh, um, monitoring the government government performance and so on. Um, thank you. I hope I didn't exceed the allocated time. Oh, thank you very much, Joel. You didn't exceed your time. Uh, before I hand you to Richard, who will be uh, chairing the question and answer, I think I will answer one question from Hanin. Hanin, technically all the papers or presentation today technically and theoretically belong to the Sudanese program. However, if you want to have one particular paper, you have to ask the person who gave that paper, he or she, and then it is up to them to see whether they want to release it to you or not. We cannot. All the presentation are going to be recorded, but we are not passing that, you know, any paper to anybody. Um, and hence I ask, um, Peter, whether I could circulate the la his paper. It's up to him to tell us whether he wants or not. Now, I come back to you, Johara. I got two points, and I think it's very important. Perhaps you could elaborate in the question and answer. The first, Sudan wasn't a colony, never be a colony. Sudan was a condominium between Egypt and Britain. So we talk about colonizer, effectively the British rule, but technically it is not a colony. And hence, some Sudanese say, we wish we were a colonies in order to be part of the Commonwealth. So that's not part of the Commonwealth because it wasn't a colony. So please, in the future, you have to clarify what you say. And the second, I wonder whether it occurs to you that the first 25 years of British in the Sudan who built the Jazeera scheme, 25 years, the British taxpayer to build the Jazeera and who destroyed the Jazeera, the Sudanese the Afandia and the political structure. And for example, the British taxpayer ordinary built up the Kitchener School of Medicine. Not Sudanese, but the British tax. And these are facts has to be has to be told rather than just be swept as colonialism. You know, history is very important to tell us lesson, you know, that we should learn from the past. So and the last point which I want to perhaps you could elaborate is this enormous gap between Khartoum and the outlying area. And hence the Southern Sudanese say, we don't want to be part of Sudan. Darfurians say, we don't want to be part of Sudan. South Kordofan, and it, even among the Nubians. And that is important because people sitting in Khartoum think the world of themselves and they consume enormous amount of money of the income to the state, whether from the outside or from taxation. If you go to the outlying area, you know, to talk to people, they say, well, those Nasal Khartoum, we have nothing to do with them. Why? Because they don't want to listen to their own ordinary people to get some ideas how development should be conducted. No, they sit in their offices with their air conditions and design all these policies for the rest of the Sudan. 
That is wrong as far as I'm concerned. But I leave that to you. Perhaps you could elaborate, Johara, later. I hand now to Richard to conduct the question and answer. Thank you very much, Johara. And thank everybody, but I'll talk to you later at the end. Richard? Thank you, Ahmed, and, and thank you to all four speakers. Um, and thank you to the participants, um, the audience who have been putting questions in through the Q&A button um, on your Zoom screen. And so if anyone would still like to put questions in during the next uh, 10, 20 minutes, then please do using that Q&A box uh, to type your question in. And what I'll do now is I'll, I'll bring to the speakers or communicate to the speakers um, uh, the, some of the questions that have been put but haven't yet been answered. Several of the speakers have already kindly engaged in the Q&A um, uh, button to respond to certain questions. So uh, one cluster of questions um, uh, have been focused on South Sudan and the subject of um, uh, data, transparency, and financial policies there. So uh, th these are really addressed to you, uh, Raja. Um, uh, Hanan Abbas asks, is um, regarding the lack of data and uh, ICT or com computing constraints, is that really uh, a, a problem in itself or is it that transparency is the problem or uh, that's what I understood her question to be. And Hanan also asked, is there a policy on financial inclusion? So that's one question uh, for you, Raja. And then a second question, um, uh, several people asked about um, mobile payment, mobile banking services. Andreas Burkhard asks, um, what about mobile payment and mobile banking uh, availability? Um, is that or is that helping or can that help to overcome infrastructure constraints in South Sudan? And Pamela Lamoro uh, mentions the example of airtime money, um, a mobile money transfer system in East Africa, which uh, has been very successful there and is, uh, she describes as almost a surrogate or substitute currency. Um, so Pamela asks, what, what about South Sudan? Uh, so the same sort of linked question to Andres there, what are the prospects for mobile money uh, transfer and banking? Um, so I'll pause there, uh, Reja, and pass those questions to you if you'd like to respond. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, audience, for the questions. Uh, question number one, uh, it's asking about the data transparency in South Sudan. Yeah, as I stated earlier on, um, we still have a, a challenge of data, although we have the, the National, National Bureau of Statistics that is responsible for collection of data in the economy. But uh, in most cases, uh, they complain that there is lack of uh, funds. Uh, to support the activities of the data. So there's still a problem with uh, data transparency in the country. Uh, the next question is about the, uh, the mobile banking availability in South Sudan. Uh, this is not yet uh, available in the, in the country. Uh, and then another question is regarding the mobile money transfer in South Sudan. We have the mobile money transfer. We have uh, the M groups, uh, that means that uh, the mobile money, and then we have the nine pay. So this uh, mobile money transfer uh, here in the country, it has started actually operating and still uh, it's maybe a matter of um, awareness, you know, to the people and the importance of uh, uh, registering for this mobile money uh, transfer in South Sudan. Did I answer all the questions or there's a question that I didn't answer? Thank you, Rajan. Uh, you did answer the, 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 the first two questions I put. Um, since you responded to those very quickly, um, I'll put two more questions that were uh, directed to you. Um, Elizabeth Burko asks, um, uh, how does the central bank in Juba manage monetary policy? Is there any 
moved interest rate based monetary policy and and secondly she also asks um uh is there a dual banking system islamic banking and conventional banking and pamela lamuro asks uh, can you say anything about how to enhance the credibility of the banking system so three three items there if you want to respond to those thank you very much richard and uh for the audience that asked the questions once again, uh, how does uh, the Bank of South Sudan or the central bank manage the monetary policy? I already stated on uh, during my presentation that uh, we have uh, some few monetary policies, like uh, at the moment now, we have the, the foreign exchange auction to the, uh, to the Forex Bureau. And this is mainly to withdraw the cash from the circulation. And then also we had uh, the rapid credit facility that was uh, awarded to, to the government, you know, by the uh, International Monetary Fund. And that is basically like to at least reinforce the, the, uh, the central bank. And then of course, from the fiscal side, then uh, it is used to, uh, to fund the, the government operations and the expenditure in the economy. The next question is about the, whether this Islamic banking or this conventional bank have the conventional banking. And then uh, I think I mentioned on, the, on, the, on my policy recommendation, something to do with the credibility of the banking system uh, in, in the country earlier on. And then I, I emphasize more on the, the independency of the, of, the, of, the, of the Bank of South Sudan, you know, so that uh, the Bank of South Sudan implement its major objectives of major uh, function uh, to supervise the commercial banks, also to uh, act as the land, uh, the lender of uh, last resort, and uh, also to provide maybe uh, capital for the banks that are now doing, you know, they are in in in, in trouble or that are about to close down. So. Um, Maybe we should also uh, think about the, the mobile banking, you know, so the commercial banks should actually think about upgrading their products to the, the modern banking system. So I hope I answered the question sufficiently. Thank you. And um, uh, more questions are welcome if you have. Thank you very much, Raja. Um, we'll give you a rest and move to some of the other questions that have come in. Uh, so another, all the questions have been clustered uh, around topics that each speaker has spoken on. So um, South Sudan and land tenure. Uh, one question uh, was about what is the situation regarding land used by um, uh, nomadic groups or pastoralists? And that question came from Igor Faru. And uh, then in a second question to you, Peter, is uh, regarding the, the changes in the number of states and the, before that, the, the three region system. Um, um, Sabina Lokalong asks, well, asks us about at what point exactly were the, was the three region system abolished? And I think Sabina, Sabina is also asking whether, the C, whether there was a missed opportunity when the CPA was signed, whether the CPA could have taken a path of reinforcing or re-establishing the, the, the three region system. If that's not exactly what, I, what you meant, Sabina, then please put your question again or I'll give you the microphone. Um, so those two questions really, um, I'll first put to you, Peter. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for passing on these questions. Um, uh, land use by nomadic groups, uh, okay, like, by other by nomadic group, like I mentioned uh, during my presentation, actually shortly after the start of the CPA, we, the pattern of conflicts that emerged, you know, there was escalation in conflicts that already, that were already there, and then new patterns of conflict emerged. Of course, we have uh, the land use, especially by nomadic tribes, more particularly in the greater Upper Nile region, has been really problematic, in a sense that uh, there was a shift from you know, the traditional way of fighting and resolving conflicts to the use of light arms, which were not part of, which were not uh, very prevalent before. 
And then to complicate things further, the changes in the number of the states actually led also to the emergence of hard borders or borders that did not exist. And especially with this perception that the states or counties or bombers are being created along ethnic lines. And then there was this discussion of, okay, you belong to here or you belong to there, you're not supposed to cross this. While actually this in practice is almost impossible in some contexts. You know, there's areas whereby during flood, during rainy season, for example, when some areas floods, you know, communities have to move to certain grazing land to go and graze their cows. And then during dry season, they go to the torch or the swamps. So with the new states with the new perceptions of borders, then it was becoming problematic. And in many cases, actually, it has been increasing the conflict. That, actually, it has added to the conflict dynamic, which was already there. Uh, more fights uh, have been reported. And maybe, maybe practical example on this is maybe the di dynamics in, uh, in, uh, in Upper Nile, when the creation of borders or the creation of new states, the increase from 28 to 32 led to the creation of the Western and the Eastern Upper Nile. And in that case is actually, and then we have the new states being allocated along ethnic line, whereby east of the, east of, east of the Nile was perceived to be a Dinka territory, while the West to be a Shuru. And then that became problematic to pastoralists who have been crossing and who have been moving along that line. And actually some, some evidence suggests that that had led the rebellion by other groups to fight against the government simply because they think uh, the government is giving out their land. So yes, the answer to this question is the creation of the new states had actually complicated uh, what was already complicated before that, uh, especially between nomadic groups. In relation to the question, when was the three regions abolished? You know, the thing is like, again, like during my presentation, you know, there have been really, I don't know whether to call it abolishment or shift. First of all, we had, you had, okay, South Sudan, after the Addis Ababa agreement, South Sudan was one block. We know, okay, there are three provinces. South Sudan was one block, but then Nimeri decided that no, it is now three different, each of the provinces should be a territory. So whether we like it or not, this is already a division <laughs> of these territories of this one block into 30 territories. And then in 1992, when he introduced, when Omar al-Bashir introduced the state system, uh, he did not talk of, okay, within the three provinces, there will be 10 states. He said South Sudan now is considered to be 10 states. So that automatically means this idea of province was not there. But again, we know actually that the creation of the states or province or whatever, these are all the manipulations of the structures that have been there with the colonialism actually okay ahmed ahmed may differ with me he was talking about sudan was not colonized or, <laughs> but again I, I call it colonialism with colonialism actually you know the basis of the structure we have first of all the 21 districts in south sudan these are the creation of the colonial administration and then now what we have the counties and the payams and the bomas most of them these are the actual villages created to administer the indirect rule system. So, uh, for example, the states that the states that emerged. Peter, Peter, there's a difference between colonialism and colony. I was okay. talking colony. Sudan <laughs> wasn't a colony. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, so then, then for example, if you look at the states, uh, an example, Central Equatorial State, it was the merger of the two districts of Juba and Da. So. Whether, whether we can say that the districts were abolished and then a state was formed or not is something different. But the fact is, all actually the system in place will say, okay, from today onwards is a state. So the districts that you had does not count anymore. Or in 1992 specifically, Omar al-Bashir said, we have 10 states in South Sudan and nobody was mentioning province anymore. So I hope, I hope this answers. <laughs> was there a third question? Sorry. And, and thank you, Peter. Um, that was, uh, they were the first two uh, questions I recorded for you. Um, a third, uh, I mean, not so much a question, but um, Anissa Jha um, mentioned uh, in some of the chat about the challenges of renewing uh, land leases, um, for example, for, for plantations. Um, mm -hmm. um, 
I don't know if you have anything you'd like to say about that, or uh, yeah, I, I, I can say I can say something on that. Yes, uh, you know, maybe Please. the first the first question is the first question should be, for example, how did you acquire that land? Mm. Uh, like I say during my presentation, before that, actually, you know, unregistered land according to the 1970 land the unregistered land ordinance, all lands not registered belongs to the state. So I guess, I guess the land Anis is talking about, <laughs> he must have acquired from the state when the state was the owner of the land. But now with the changes that the, land, the community should own land, maybe, maybe what he should consider is to go and uh, renegotiate with them. Thank you, Peter. I'll, I'll move on uh, to the questions. We've got some, we do have some more questions about uh, banking system in South Sudan, uh, but let's move to some of the questions about Sudan. Um, uh, Iman, uh, Sharif, you, you've kindly responded to some of the questions already in, uh, directly. Um, one remaining question, I think, was a question about um, uh, whether there have been assessments of the impact of US dollar usage, uh, assessments of the impact of US dollar use in consumption and in production. Does it mean um, concerning um, um, uh, foreign direct investment? I is it related to this? Yes, foreign direct investment when it's directed towards uh, productive uh, productivity rather than towards um, consumption. Yes. Um, I, I, the the uh, the question was from Hanan Abbas. Uh, you asked whether there was at any time a real impact assessment as to the um, dollar spent in production. And because uh, for Sudan itself, uh, yes, there's been, when um, uh, foreign direct investment arrived for petrol, um, and um, a large portion of it was paid in debt uh, for the uh, the Chinese companies or already, uh, you know, they took like 50% of the pay and the government was left with 40 that was shared between both. Um, maybe this is uh, what Hanan wanted to know, what's the benefit from foreign direct investment, you know. Um, uh, uh, no, maybe more studies need to be done, um, more investigations, maybe more analysis, more data uh, needs to be done as well. Um, Thank you, Iman. Um, I'm going to put some of the questions that um, uh, were addressed to Johara. Uh, some of those you might also want to com comment on since there's an overlap or since they're, they're relevant to public sector institutions include the financial institutions in Sudan. Um, so Syed Abbas asks uh, you, Johara, um, whether what is needed is focus on institution building or focus on performance. And um, so that's one question. The second question, Johara, is from Elizabeth Burko. What specifically, she asks, do people want to see dismantled or changed from the structures of the former government, the old re former regime? Um, um, and a, and a, another question that Elizabeth Burko asks, uh, if you can comment or have any comment about the decision of the military to, to move the activities of some of its, uh, uh, of at least one commercial um, holding, uh, sorry, the, she asked if you have any comment about the recent decision by the military to move the commercial activities of one of its holding companies uh, into the purview of the Ministry of Finance. And she asks, would that be a sign of a changing power dynamic in favor of civilian income? Um, so those are three questions initially to, to you, Johara. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for summarizing the questions. Um, to answer the first point, whether we should focus on um, building institutions or improve the performance, I would say um, these two aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, uh, in some structures, some transitional government structures, the institutions haven't been built yet, and I've mentioned the example of commissions uh, at different levels and other um, uh, on the state levels, for instance, the performance of um, localities, the performance of other existing institutions need to be improved for them to um, to, uh, to 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 
to, to provide what they're set for. Um, the second point was regarding the, I believe it was, um, I'm sorry, and if I missed it, I believe it was regarding the Richard. Sorry, the second question was, um, uh, um, when one talks about dismantling um, or changing structures from the old regime, what specifically are people meaning? What maybe what yeah. specific institutions or structures? Yeah, so mainly um, the, the the prevalent discourse is that uh, uh, this, by dismantling we mean uh, we mean taking the wealth of the people back. However, there is another aspect to it is um, to uh, take the, the institutional building back to a basis of meritocracy. So, for instance, as I've mentioned um, during the historical um, review, is that at the certain areas the regime was systematically taking out competent workers and uh, competent employees out of the out of the civil service system and replacing them with people that uh, don't necessarily have the adequate skills and adequate knowledge to fill these positions uh, and solely because they were belonging to certain um, regimes and, 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 and so on, to the, to the regime ideology and so on. So this is what I meant. So it, it can be like um, bringing back the, the world and it can, uh, it can mean like uh, bringing um, the meritocracy aspect back to um, the institutions. Um, the last point, I believe it was regarding the the transition of certain um, uh, to, the, uh, to certain security or, or military um, companies back to the ownership of the state, uh, namely the Ministry of Finance and so on. I believe it is a move towards the right um, direction and it, it, it weighs more on the civilian arm. However, to what extent? Because um, I don't want to be a, a pessimist, but we need to wait and see how this process is going to take place and whether it is going to unfold in a, in a, in a good way. Because we've been here promises since the beginning of the transitional period and, uh, and I don't want to jump to conclusions before things actually take place. Thank you uh, for, for those responses, Johara. Um, one uh, question that uh, maybe several of you might want to speak about um, is, um, um, the person who put this question didn't include their name, um, but it was, when will the four freedoms be implemented? So this is a question regarding the economic relationship between the two Sudans, South Sudan and Sudan, and the question is, when will the four freedoms be implemented? And where are, where are, the, where are data about trade between the, between the two countries? Um, um, perhaps I, I'll pass that uh, question first to you, Iman, since there's a, a data aspect to that. And also you spoke about debt between the two countries. Yeah. Um, yeah, and um, I think it was hope uh, ASAP, the four freedoms, uh, at some point when Bashir was still there, I remember, uh, well, uh, because, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, the, I don't know what happened. At some point in time, there were clashes between the two governments, and uh, then things calmed down, and then the, the borders opened, and people started trading, and... Um, but I believe ASAP, because for the benefit of both people, uh, like we said, we, we um, better people rely on two governments. Uh, we have a, a, a huge question of po poverty to alleviate and uh, we need help from international friends and donors, yes, but there is a big homework that we both sides need to do. So uh, till now, we are both ruled by corruption. You know, they, they have wasted uh, our resources, uh, the petrol, they've wasted. We don't know where the money has gone. And I, I believe uh, we, we won't see it again and um, uh, for both sides. And um, till now, both sides are ruled by corruption. <laughs> we have to get rid of this corruption so we can uh, start rebuilding uh, uh, both uh, both sides and uh, data um, data is a problem on on, on both sides um, it's it, it is there it's not impossible um, um, uh, some institutions in uh, in in Sudan uh, they keep uh, it's 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 not automated. We have you have to look through the books, through the uh, studies. Maybe universities are a good place. From my own experience, 
uh, I, I started collecting data uh, information about, uh, I had to look through universities and um, publications. Um, most of it is not automated, you know, it's not straightforward. So uh, institutions, um, it, it is there, but it, you need to look and dig hard to, to sort it out, sorry. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Iman, for that. Uh, uh, that response. Um, uh, do any of the other speakers wish to say anything about um, the, the economic relationship between the two countries and the four freedoms? Um, if not, then, uh, then I'll perhaps pass back to Ahmed Ashahi because I think we've reached the end of the questions uh, that have been put in the box. Yes, but if there are no other questions, then we will end up this meeting and by saying, you know, thank you very much indeed for all our speakers. Um, the themes of their presentation were really interesting and up to date. And these, some of them are endemic problems in both Sudan and South Sudan. And hopefully we will continue to address some of these questions and issues in our future meeting, whether in person or through Zoom webinar. Um, so I would say thank you very much and have a good weekend. And thank we hope you. to see you at our future you know, um, webinar on 22nd, where the youth will be speaking mm -hmm. about the future of their countries, both in Sudan and South Sudan. And thank you, Richard, for sharing it. And thank you, Caroline, the administrator, uh, for um, helping us administratively and technically over this. Good. Well, many thanks. And thank you, Anis. And thank, thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, all good wishes. Thank you. Wish you all a good weekend. And, uh, and you too. Let's yeah. all get together again soon. This was, this was well, a terrific uh, conference. Thank you very much to the speakers and to everybody. Thank you very much for thank participating. Nice thank you. See you. Thank you, Peter. And Reja. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Alaikum salam. Peace. 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 Peace.